Hello, and welcome to the third episode of Conversations in the Field. I'm Melinda Hare, and I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator for the Edisto Island Open Land Trust. Today, we are very fortunate to have my colleague, Mr. Tom Austin. Thank you for having me. Tom is a graduate of Clemson with a degree in wildlife and fisheries biology. He's also published in the area of entomology, and he's the author of our weekly series, Flora and Fauna, that everybody looks forward to on our social media. So Tom is going to talk a little bit about meadows and grasslands and their importance to this place here at the Hutchinson House, as well as other parts of the island and just the whole big picture of the ecosystem we call meadows and grasslands. So Tom, take it away. Certainly. As Melinda said, today we're out here at the Hutchinson House. More specifically, we're out here in the wildflower meadows on the adjacent lot. And as many of you know, but some of you may not, uh, the Hutchinson House is a historic Freedman home built circa 1885 by Henry Hutchinson uh, when he married his wife, Rosa Swinton. Henry's father, Jim, was a war hero during the Civil War for the Union Navy. Uh, he was also an important community leader, civil rights activist, and politician here on Edisto Island during the Reconstruction Era and the Hutchinson House passed through many generations of the Hutchinson family before it was eventually purchased by the Edisto Island Open Land Trust in 2016 uh, with the goal of restoring and preserving the house and the land surrounding it. In 2019, we purchased the adjacent nine acres uh, with the help of the Charleston County Greenbelt Program, and today we're here to talk about these gorgeous wildflower meadows that exist naturally, well, naturally, we'll get to that, here on this property. Now, Meadows, specifically wildflower meadows, are a subset of grasslands and they're a type of early successional habitat. Now early successional habitat are, is the stage of an ecosystem's life at this very beginning, uh, right after some serious disturbance events, say uh, a storm surge, logging, a wildfire, something like that. Something that has damaged the existing botanical community and so the plant life is trying to regenerate uh, from a earlier damaged state. Now, in order to talk about early successional habitat, we also need to talk about ecological succession as a concept. Now, ecological succession is the continuum of stages that an ecosystem will pass through as it heads towards equilibrium and a climax community situation. Now, a meadow is what would be considered an early successional habitat, uh, specifically before it starts to become a forest. Uh, here in the Lowcountry, practically all of our ecosystems eventually end up as a forest if left to their own devices. Now following a grassland would be something like a pine forest, and then eventually it would end up in a climax, oak, hickory, longleaf, pine sort of forest situation. Now the reason why an early successional habitat exists is because of some kind of outward disturbance. Now naturally this is gen generally occurs due to some hydrological events, uh, either flooding or a storm surge or something like that. Uh, historically, it also happened due to uh, Native American use of prescribed fire to maintain open areas for hunting and agriculture. Nowadays, uh, a lot of the disturbance that's needed in order to maintain a early successional habitat comes from humans. It's plowing, prescribed fire, um, mowing, uh, flooding, say, in a managed impoundment, uh, that sort of thing. The, these habitats need to be maintained to keep them in this current state. Otherwise, uh, trees from the neighboring forests will begin to invade, usually pine trees, sweet gums, and other species that are dispersed via windblown seeds. They'll begin to colonize the meadow, they'll pop out, they'll start shading out all the grasses around them, and as they reach maturity, they themselves will drop seeds, and the spread of trees will expand rapidly through the meadow until eventually it gets to a point where uh, squirrels and rodents and wildlife will start moving in larger seeds, and it'll, it'll roll into a more hardwood-dominated forest. So in order to keep that from happening, um, managers and ecologists need to periodically disturb the environment to remove trees and um, invasive species, shrubs, and uh, other plants that would otherwise start to convert it into a later stage of succession. Which isn't to say that forests or trees are a bad thing, it's just that when you're trying to have a meadow and you have trees in it, it's not really good for the meadow. And also briefly, I'd like to touch on the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, which is an idea that um, somewhere in the middle between uh, the most disturbed possible ecosystem and one that's totally untouched, there exists a Goldilocks zone where the highest amount of biodiversity can exist. Um, 
And this is the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. And typically we see that to be generally the case. One example I can think of off the top of my head though is salt marsh. Uh, the salt marsh is disturbed four times a day. The tide comes in, the tide goes out, the tide comes back in, and it goes back out. And that continuous in inundation with saline water um, keeps that in a permanent grassland state. The salt marsh, although it is a grassland, it is the climax community for that ecosystem because nothing else can exist there. And you can see based off of the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, there's really only about a dozen, dozen and a half, maybe two dozen species that can survive in that sort of environment indefinitely. Whereas out here in this meadow, I can count that many just staring around looking at the trees and the plants I see around me. And there's many more, possibly hundreds of species out here. Now, historically, before colonization, uh, grasslands were primarily maintained by the Native Americans' use of prescribed fire in order to create um, cleared areas for agriculture to open up savannas and grasslands in order to improve their hunting success, uh, to draw in wildlife with food plots, that sort of thing. Um, then as coloni colonization occurred, there was actually a rapid expansion in the amount of grasslands, although they weren't really natural. Um, logging fronts moving through the countryside, logging forests opened up that habitat and created areas where grasslands could establish. However, generally right behind those were uh, conversions into agricultural fields. However, traditional agriculture uh, generally left a lot of um, idle land, areas, uh, margins around fields, fallow fields, uh, areas that there just wasn't the labor to work, and these actually created great areas for natural meadows to establish. So actually there for a while, there was quite a deal of um, native grasslands following colonization, but that didn't last very long. Uh, as plantation agriculture really came into full swing, uh, there was an emphasis on uh, making all of the agricultural lands as productive as possible, but this still left a good deal of uh, land available for, you know, grasslands to exist in. The edges around fields and fallow fields that were out of rotation. Um, it did start to really dwane after um, the introduction of Sea Island Cotton as that focus on productivity really ramped up, but it wasn't terrible. Really, our major losses in grasslands started to occur in the 20th century, following uh, the mechanization and uses of modern farming practices. Now, modern farming practices are great for making food, but they're not great for grasslands because they're super efficient, so they don't leave much idle land uh, hanging around. Uh, when land starts to get tired, they add fertilizer. Uh, if weeds start to encroach from the edge of fields, they apply herbicides or they clear trees and there just wasn't much room left for grasslands. And as a result, the number of grasslands really started to wane uh, about the middle of the 20th century. And then following that, small-scale ag agriculture uh, really became commercially unviable. And uh, a lot of small farms um, closed up and they started converting into forests. Once again, forests are great. There's nothing wrong with trees, but you know, if everything's trees, then there's no place for grass. And as these small farms uh, began to convert into um, timberlands, uh, some of the more, um, the higher areas with the better views began to become urbanized. Properties were sold off, subdivided, and turned into um, subdivisions and urban centers. And over time, these areas began to spread outward and crop up in new locations until eventually there was no native habitat remaining in between them. And grasslands and suburbia just don't mix, you know. Um, to most people, this is a field of weeds. It would be much better if it was a lawn, but to me, this is far more beautiful than any manicured lawn. Now, because of this, um, native, healthy wildflower meadows and grasslands are few and far between in the low country, and particularly on Edisto Island. All of those that do exist have human interference to thank. Um, in those disturbances I was talking about when I was discussing ecological succession, things like plowing, bush hogging, prescribed fire, they keep these grasslands open and they allow these native plants to exist indefinitely. However, in order to manage a grassland like this, in order to have the greatest wildlife habitat and the best um, ecological health and uh, botanical diversity, they have to be actively managed. And this is done through proper timing of uh, prescribed fire or bush hogging, uh, the deliberate removal of uh, woody plants uh, and direct control of invasive species like Chinese privet and vasi grass that come into these me meadows and they start to create a monoculture and push out native plants. 
Because of that, uh, many of our native upland grasslands need our management in order to protect the critical ecosystem services that they provide and the important wildlife habitat that they provide to our wildlife here on Edisto Island. That being said, why are native grasslands important? Why do wildflower meadows matter to the residents of the low country? Well, first off, they provide great wildlife habitat. Uh, there are many species that depend on open grasslands and other early successional habitats that would struggle or go extinct without them. Species like sedrins, marsh rabbits, a lot of our sharp-tailed sparrows, like Henslow's Leconts and grasshopper sparrows, field sparrows, uh, yellow-breasted chats, eastern bluebirds, American kestrels, northern harriers, the red-shouldered hawk, northern bobwhite, uh, cotton rats, many of our native mice and bat species, and of course, our native wildflower and grass species that can't exist beneath a forest. Another thing that people don't think about is that our native grasslands are great for fighting erosion, uh, for keeping agricultural runoff out of our waterways, and even sequestering carbon to help fight climate change. A lot of our native grasses, like this blue stem right here, have really deep, expansive, fibrous root systems. And these roots expand out and really hold onto the soil and fight erosion. Uh, and these roots also extend deep, deep down in the soil, sometimes two, three feet even, in our deep, sandy uh, soils here in the coastal plain. And as these roots extend down in the soil, they fluff it up, um, uh, they fight soil compaction, and this, this allows them and the surrounding herbaceous plants uh, to really grab onto uh, excessive nutrients and agricultural runoff, secure them, um, convert them into their own biomass, and then pump them down into the soil, where they stay and enrich the soil beneath the grassland and don't pollute our waterways, leading to significant water quality issues like algal blooms and oceanic dead zones. Additionally, grasses are actually far more efficient at photosynthesis than many broadleaf plants, and as such, they can convert far more um, atmospheric carbon dioxide into biomass. And because of their deep root system, they pump this carbon down into the soil, pulling it out of the atmosphere and locking it away. In many forest ecosystems, uh, much of the carbon is stored in the trunks of the trees, uh, whereas in a grassland, a lot of the carbon is sequestered down into the soil where it actually improves uh, the soil if it was ever to be reconverted into agriculture. And it also bolsters the biodiversity by allowing far more plants to be able to colonize and survive because there's many more uh, nutrients and organic matter in the soil available. And of course, as this provides wildlife habitat, it also provides uh, habitat to native pollinators. I mean, it is a wildflower meadow, of course. They provide pollen and nectar to not only our native um, bees and wasps and butterflies, but they also provide it to local colonies kept by beekeepers. And they also create, you know, brood and nesting habitat uh, for our native pollinator species as well. So these act as uh, sources of native pollinators that then head out into the surrounding area and improve the success of surrounding garden and um, agricultural fields uh, by assisting in the pollination of crops. And by helping support the colonies of local beekeepers, they can then take their bees to agricultural productions and assist in pollination there. So what are we doing out here at the Hutchinson House to try and help this meadow? Well, I'm glad you asked. What we're really trying to do is keep this meadow how it is. When we purchased this property, this meadow was already in excellent condition, and we don't want to accidentally mess that up. Uh, so really all we're, we're doing at the moment is removing trees as they appear in the meadow, and we're also um, bush hogging it semi-regularly every couple of years uh, just to add a little bit of disturbance and allow some plants to recolonize and distribute within the meadow um, you know just just to keep things healthy in addition to protecting the meadow we also want to try and increase uh, wildlife habitat and we we do this by the way that we manage the meadow and also um, by introducing um, some more native plant species that are, are common throughout uh, the early successional habitats around Edisto Island, but for one reason or another, don't exist here in this meadow. Things like milkweeds, coreopsis, frostweed, hairy leaf cup, uh, and many other species that you've assuredly seen on the side of the road that just for whatever reason aren't here. And by adding these species, uh, we create more opportunities for insects uh, to colonize the meadow, increasing their diversity, which then again also uh, creates food for native wildlife particularly birds, uh, as well as creating some structure within the meadow that is then again used by birds, rodents, rabbits, and such, 
which then improves habitat, so on and so forth. It's ecology, you guys understand it. We're also actively working to try and keep invasive species out of the field. Uh, all along this meadow, there's uh, invasive Chinese privet that's established. There's a mimosa tree standing right there that I need to get to, as well as Chinese wisteria and vasi grass. Uh, these are species not native to Edisto Island uh, that have managed to colonize this area over the last uh, century or so, and uh, they need to be actively controlled to keep them from taking over the meadow. Uh, invasive species are bad because they get into an ecosystem and they displace um, native plants and animals, and sometimes they even directly harm those animals, and eventually they take over and they just dramatically reduce biodiversity. In addition to reintroducing some native plants uh, to this meadow, uh, we also have, you know, bird boxes scattered around the property. Uh, these are mostly aimed at uh, providing nesting habitat for eastern bluebirds, but also uh, Carolina chickadees, tufted titmice, and Carolina wrens will utilize these nest boxes uh, periodically throughout the year, usually after the eastern bluebirds. I, I've also built a uh, rocket bat box, which I plan to put up on a pole in the middle of this field, hopefully sooner rather than later, and uh, I'm making efforts in order to secure materials to build bee motels to install around the property. And bee motels provide nesting habitat for both native bees and wasps that are important pollinators here in the meadow. Another important aspect about our management of the meadow out here is we want you, the viewer, to be able to come out here, visit it, and learn about its significance. In order to do so, I've built trails all along the perimeter of this meadow, which help function to keep the forest from invading the meadow from the edges, but they allow you to come out here and really get deep into this meadow and just appreciate it for what it is. In addition to the trails, I, I also have grant funding from the Carolina Butterfly Society to install a butterfly and pollinator garden here in some of the more disturbed areas of the meadow where there's currently not a great um, a botanical composition. And what this garden seeks to do is really allow visitors to hone in and look at individual plants and the significance that they have, as well as provide a, a sort of a fallback area where some of those species I mentioned that I wanted to introduce into the meadow uh, will always exist in the field and can be utilized by pollinators and birds uh, from the surrounding meadows. You know, thing, things like milkweed in particular. There's no milkweed out here in this meadow, but I'd love for this area to have a, you know, stable population of monarch butterflies and raise a couple of broods every year. I'm also working to create interpretive signage to install around the property uh, to allow visitors to learn about the importance of our wildflower meadows and what we're doing out here at the Hutchinson House uh, as they wander the trails uh, or visit the pollinator garden. And I'm also producing other types of media to bring to you, the viewer at home, like articles in this video, so that uh, you can learn about what we're doing out here at the Hutchinson House and why the meadows out here and the habitat management that we're doing is important. So there you have it, the meadows and grasslands at the Hutchinson House. And we're very fortunate to have Mr. Tom Austin on our staff. And every day he teaches us all something new. So we're, we're really fortunate to have Tom. And I hope you'll get to visit the Hutchinson House or at least drive by. It's on Point of Pine Roads and it's truly a work in progress. So if you'd like to come out and check on the progress, we do have a parking lot here. It is a fenced area. We ask that you don't come onto the major part of the property, but from the fenced area, you're able to see a lot. And I know, Tom, you had a big part in the design of that. So anything you'd like to add? Certainly. Um, we hope to have the trails here in the meadow open to the public sometime in the next year with any luck. Uh, currently we're waiting for the restoration of the house to complete because with the ongoing construction it's not really safe for uh, visitors to be wandering around the house uh, with the construction tra traffic and the potential of falling debris and we still need to work a little bit on the trails before they're open to everybody. Sounds great. So join us next time when we bring you the fourth episode of Conversations in the Field and thanks to Tom for today's great production.